She's a feminist, she's an activist, and she's a champion for women's rights. My chat with Selma James, the widow of the late CLR James, up next on Carib Nation. Welcome to Carib Nation. I'm Darius Dean. I have the great honor today of talking with Selma James, the widow of the late, great CLR James. And we are going to talk about your new book, Sex, Race, and Class. Welcome to Carib Nation, and it is my honor and pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah. Now, you've been on a tour around the United States and Canada. How has your tour been going? Well, I think it's been rather striking how times have changed, how uh, many people's minds are open to new ideas, and to seeing the case that women have to make for ourselves, not merely the narrow case that some feminists have made, but the case of the women at the bottom, mm -hmm. um, the case of the welfare mother, the case of the woman who goes out to work in order to feed her children, and the desperate poverty that has descended on millions of women mm -hmm. and their children. And, that and we are that speaking changed. to that. Mm -hmm. Now, talk a little bit about the premise on which you decided to bring these writings together to address this issue, which, as you said, is still going on and is as new today as it was when you started writing about sex, race, class, women, the, the underclass of women, so to speak. Well, I think it's important to know that women reproduce the human race. And I don't consider that a marginal activity, mm -hmm. but it's treated like one, as if it's not important, as if their children are not important, and as if the work of caring, which mothers do, and many others, and the caring work of women generally, mm -hmm. is not counted, uh, is not paid for. We do the work unwaged and is not acknowledged as the work that's crucial to making society. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we women, um, despite many differences among us of race and age and immigration status mm -hmm. and what country we're in and what the technology is in the country, that we are all doing this work and we're all doing this work without wages. Mm -hmm. We have that in common. That's what we can come together on. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that when we come together on this, we forget the differences among us, because sure. a woman raising a child in Ghana or in New Delhi in India is not facing exactly the same problems that those of us are, are raising children in Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. or in California, or indeed in Port of Spain in Trinidad. But, and there are various levels of wealth that, that, that just that placement tells you about. Mm -hmm. But we are all facing the crisis of feeding our children and doing the work that we have to do to care for everybody in the society and at the same time get wages by work outside the home. Yeah. And this is killing women. It's destroying us by overwork and by underpay. Yes. And yeah. we must address this. Anyone who is interested in the benefits and welfare and equity of women has to be interested in the elimination mm -hmm. of poverty. Otherwise, I don't think they're serious. They're <laughs> thinking about themselves, but not, yes, they're not thinking about the rest of mm -hmm. us. You coined that phrase, unwaged uh, women, when you started looking at why women were not really getting the benefit of what they were trying to do at home. They were working, as you say, very hard, taking care of everybody and then having to go out to work, or working both at the same time. Uh, over the years, we, we hear the argument that feminists changed the thinking of women, um, that there, we have two types of feminists. Uh, where do you come down on that? Well, you know, there's a really, there has been a major class division among women 
and feminism has not always been on the grassroots side. Mm -hmm. Many feminists have broken the glass ceiling and they never look down again. Mm -hmm. They look to the boardroom, they look to uh, positions in Congress or in Parliament depending on their country, they look to their own advancement, but they're not looking, unfortunately, to what the situation is of the women who built the movement that enabled them to, to move up. There. And I think there's a debt that those women have to the rest of us who worked very hard to make women's case. And there's been a demeaning of the housewife, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they seem to think, because the government has told them so, that a good mother is somebody who leaves her children behind and gets a job. Mm -hmm. A good mother is somebody who puts her children first. Whether she gets a job or she doesn't, whatever exactly. she wants to do with mm -hmm. her life is her right. But it's also her right to have the support of society because she is making the whole human race and therefore she is entitled, first of all, to welfare. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we are campaigning about now, the return of welfare to the single mother. Second of all, she's entitled to pay equity and mm -hmm. I definitely agree with the movement for abortion and for those rights to be ours. But I also agree that pay equity is the priority because it's the priority for women mm -hmm. and that the right to have children is our right. I remember, you know, in Jamaica when I lived there for some months and they said they had an advert every day on the radio. That was really where it was at then. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. <laughs> And they would say, well, William and I are getting married and we're not going to have children until we can afford them. And I was really struck by that advert because most women in Jamaica will never afford children. Mm. You know, it's as though you're telling poor women that you may as well just forget, forget about, about motherhood mm -hmm. because you will never be able to afford it. And to me, the most important thing is those children. The most important thing is caring for them. and. As a woman who's concerned with women's rights, I'm determined, as many of my sisters are, that not only women, but men also prioritize children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, in a country like this, the, the working day should be cut mm -hmm. so that men have time to get to know their children right. and to get to know how to care for people mm -hmm. and not only think about themselves. I think being a mother is a civilizing influence and we'd like men to be civilized too. Well, they are coming around, I think, are they? Yes. <laughs> we, we can see, um, my husband and I talk about that up very often, and he was going to the playground, and he was a lone man, and people would look at him and wonder, it's, what's happening? Is he divorced? And, and he said, no, I, I just, his hours allowed him to be there at the time. And we look back now, 30, 40 years later, and think, wow, you see men with strollers taking their kids to school, and doing everything with the children now and then really taking care. So we've come some, we've made some strides. We have. We in have. The message on. It's so good. Mm -hmm. It's so good that men have become, have become, many men have become very interested in their children mm -hmm. and are, are satisfied by the relationship. They right. get satisfaction from the relationship. Of course. And you know, caring is a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not you do something to somebody, it's that you have a relationship yep. Yep. which is beneficial to both. And we should all be engaged in that. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. terribly important. And I think it's important that it doesn't end when, when the children grow up, mm -hmm. that people who are my age, younger and older, we are still part of society of and must be involved in the caring for others as well as others caring for us. Right, that's right. It's a two-way street. That's the world yes. we want, isn't it? Yes. yes. Well, so, so the, that's it's what a giving back uh, along the way. Yeah. That's right, and that's why I think that our campaign for welfare and for welfare to be returned, which, by the way, is based on two bills that are now in Congress. Yes, I was going to ask Congress. about that. Yes. Yeah, where <coughs> mothers should have the right to raise their own children mm -hmm. rather than having to go out to work. That was stimulated by the Mrs. Um, Romney. She said that she yes. raised five children and that it was work. Well, I don't know how many servants she had in order to do this work, but I think it was quite light for her and it's very heavy for us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we didn't have a, a lot of money 
to do it on. And I think that those bills really um, spearhead mm -hmm. a campaign to begin to address the question of poverty. How can you be liberated if you're poor? First of all, half the time you're thinking of how, how to feed your family. Meal. That's yeah. what your mind is engaged with. Right. We'd like to think higher thoughts than that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, those two um, bills in Congress you are addressing Congress on those and talking with people on the Hill about We are. Those, uh, Some of our people are on the Hill to, even as we speak, mm -hmm. uh, talking with people there. And Gwen Moore, who is from Wisconsin and who's a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, mm -hmm. was the one who spearheaded the first bill about all the caring work and how the government should support it. Uh, it has really done a fantastic job. And then Pete Stark did not get reelected in spite of his bill called the Work Act, meaning Women's Option to Raise Kids mm -hmm. Act. And we want to see what we can do to get him back into Congress and to get other Congress people to uh, take his Sign bill up and, and pass it on. And you know this nonsense that they speak, there are welfare queens, I never met one, I never heard of one. All the welfare queens and kings I know are in the banks. <laughs> they are on the highest form of welfare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is not the priority of a, a humane society. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what President Obama is going to do, but I know he owes a lot to women mm -hmm. and to people of color. Mm -hmm people of a lot of colors. Many colors, yes. Many colors indeed. <laughs> and I think everybody is going to present their bill to Mr. Obama for all the work that they did to see that he was reelected. Mm -hmm. I read that you uh, lit up when you heard the comment that uh, Anne Romney has never worked a day in her life, uh, raising her, her five boys. And as you said, the work was a different kind of work. It was indeed, <coughs> and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to exclude women who have money <coughs> from organizing with us, but the price of their organizing with us is that their points of reference are grassroots people, grassroots mm -hmm. women in particular, grassroots children, rather than their own sector. Mm -hmm. And once they do that, they, we'll be happy with them and they with us. But we haven't seen a lot of that recently. When we first began uh, demanding wages for housework, we had a woman who was um, a, the wife of Chrysler Europe. Mm -hmm. And she said, I work for the company. I work for Chrysler. I don't get a wage for it, but I work for Chrysler. I entertain his friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm definitely for wages for housework. Mm -hmm. And there was another woman who was married to an oil executive. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. I have to move country to, from country to country. My whole family, my, my furniture, my children, you know, destroyed mm -hmm. education and all the rest. Definitely we want money for this work. And we did very well. We always did very well together. Mm -hmm. But Mrs. Romney is not one of those. Do you have high hopes for what President Obama can achieve? Uh, because you say also that until politicians understand that their work is for the better of all, for the greater good, instead of for personal gain, that we are doomed to keep making the same mistakes. And in the minds of many, he is one of those who is trying to change the tide. Uh, and I wonder what is your take on that, whether you think that his, his agenda reaches out far enough? I don't know if President Obama has finally understood what he didn't understand for the first four years, that he's dependent on the rest of us yeah. to press the opposition to do what he says he wants. And whether he does or doesn't appreciate that, I think that's what we have to tell him. Mm -hmm in our millions. I don't mean you, me, and mm. another friend. I mean <laughs> thousands of women and millions of women have to write and say, we want 
welfare, and that's the only route to pay <coughs> equity, and these are our priorities, and this is how we are suffering without it. And we have to press our advantage home, because as I said, he has a debt to us. And I suspect, of course I couldn't know, but I suspect that the person who will understand that first is Michelle Obama. Of course, yeah. Because she is a carer. Mm -hmm. She cares for him. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly clear. I don't think he could keep it up without <laughs> her. Sure. And she's, she, I've seen her on the television the in bed England of that. Yeah. when she came to England and she spoke with young girls of color, young black girls. And she felt for them. Mm -hmm. She knew how it was to be them. And she wanted to be useful to them. Mm -hmm. And that was very important to those of us who were watching. Mm -hmm. And so maybe she will explain. <laughs> but even if she doesn't, we are dependent on how many people press home the advantage and to make our case clear and unambiguously so even the New York Times understands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're not pressing home only the case of women in this country. If women in Africa have to walk three and four hours a day for water and the water is dirty when they have and to they get, get it, there, yeah. and if they're, if they're spending most of their waking lives besides that, you know, doing subsistence farming, which feeds 80% of the people in Africa, you know, if they're doing that work, we have to value them. We have to val value the hours that they spend doing that work, mm -hmm. and we have to honor them by be seeing that they have what they need. First of all, water that's the clean. Infrastructure, yeah. You know, if you can send a man to the moon, and you send a thing to Mars, and a this to that, and a fighter jet, and a robot, and all the rest, <laughs> let's have a little water. Basic. You know, Basis. that's what I call uh, prioritizing the reproduction of the human race. And that is what I think is our moment now. And I don't think men are going to object to any of that. They're going to say, here, here, where, do, where can I help? I feel that we will get the men on this, on their own children being yeah. a priority, yeah. and on the food being grown, <laughs> and the women who grow it being a priority. And similar things are true in India, and similar things are true in Trinidad, mm. and Tobago, and Guyana, and in all the Caribbean region of whatever language. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a question of how much we can get together. Now, what I've been speaking about on the tour is that we want to come together, but we know we're divided, mm -hmm. and we don't want to hide those divisions, but address them. The race division must be addressed. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to undermine the division of race among us, and we have to see that we get pay equity among Equal women. Pay. Yes. Among women, not only oh, yes, women and men, but women, women and women. <laughs> we want that. And we want the immigrant woman <coughs> to get the rate for the job as mm -hmm. much as the older woman who is expected to work for less, mm -hmm. and the young girl who's supposed to work for peanuts until mm -hmm. she's what age, who knows. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I, I think is important. And it's not only the race division. It's division of, um, of whether you're a criminal or not. Because yeah. nowadays, it's almost criminal to try to feed your family. You may be a sex worker, for example, or you may mm -hmm. be imprisoned for some minor offense which has divided you from your children, mm -hmm. and we don't want that division either. Yes, and we have yes. to support the so-called criminal, the prisoner, Yeah, that's and another the issue that, that we get, we're having so many women in prisons these days. Um, when, and, and prison has become such a big business. It is, that's, it is. And that is, that's troubling. And if you go to the prison, as I sometimes do when I come to this country, because I have to see my friend Mumia Abu Jamal, oh, yes, yes. and I have to see uh, Maroon Schultz, who is on uh, in, in solitary confinement for almost 40 years. You know, mm. a brilliant man who should be among us. We need people like that. You know, who is waiting at the prison to see the prisoners? Women. Mm. Yes. Who else is doing the justice work? Yeah. Who is else is trying to keep them sane and mm -hmm. alive and in touch with their families? Women 
as part of our caring work, have always done a great deal of justice work. Mm -hmm. So these are people, these are divisions among us, and we have to see that these divisions are undermined. And to the degree that we do that, we build unity of course, and yes. have strength in the society generally. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the Caribbean. I know you're very familiar with the Caribbean. We've just celebrated 50 years of independence, Jamaica and, Barba and, and uh, Trinidad and Tobago. There is the argument that we've had 50 years of independence on paper, mm. uh, but how independent are we? And I'd like to get your thinking on where we are, where we have come, and, and the role that women have played in, or can still play, in getting the Caribbean on the right track. Well, first of all, I have to say that I <coughs> saw women in the independence and federation movement in a number of places in Trinidad, and in Jamaica and in Barbados mm -hmm. during the 50s and early 60s. And women worked very hard and were never given credit for all the work that they did for mm -hmm. the independence movement, but especially for the federation movement. You know, I found when I was there, people wanted independence, but they took it for granted. They said, oh, we're going to get that. The question is, are we going to be together and that federation did not, did not succeed, mm -hmm. and it broke some hearts, mm -hmm. including mine, <coughs> because people really <coughs> felt that they would be more powerful in the world if they were together, and the politicians were too ambitious to, to allow us to be together. That has never been resolved mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. And I see grassroots women also having to fight for the attention of women who have the university behind them or who have some profession behind them, who are not interested in domestic workers, mm -hmm. and some who are because there is some support for the domestic workers who are organizing in a number of places. In Trinidad, I think that has been a center, and in Jamaica, mm -hmm. and probably elsewhere that I don't know about. But that has been very crucial in what women have been doing to use the independence mm. and to use the facilities that some of us have got on their own behalf, mm -hmm. but I think the prize has to go to Guyana. Mm. Red Thread in Guyana is our associate there. And I have to tell you that they're extraordinary because they found a society which was divided racially mm -hmm. between people of African and uh, Indian descent, mm -hmm. as well as people of indigenous descent and indigenous culture who were the poorest and who had least, uh, you know, attention, and they brought the three races together, especially when there was a flood. They organized among mm -hmm. women a cross Perfect, race, yeah. and they formed something called G-War, Guyana Women Across Race, really, mm -hmm. against the poverty and the displacement that uh, the floods mm -hmm. caused. And they have done fantastic work there. I, I could spend a half hour speaking yes, about they, them alone. They work on the ground quietly and, and they really toil endlessly. And uh, they are. They do. Be. Let's switch just for a minute. We have a couple of minutes left and I'd like to talk about your time with CLR and, and some of the work with him. And you did refer to that also to him and some of the work that he has done. Talk a little bit about your time with him and how that has influenced what you have, con have continued to do. Uh, and, and the, the, the energy that you still have, obviously, the fire that you still obviously have. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I w when I was 15 years old, uh, joined an organization that he was part of, and I was soon in his camp because he was part of a, a split in the organization, a socialist organization and he was my political point of reference from that age. Mm -hmm. And he has always been my political point of reference. And when we got together in the early 50s, he really educated me about politics and how to look at it and how to organize. Mm. You know, I think people have think of that politics is about thought and ideas. Well, it's about 
how to organize. Mm. It's how to get people together. As President and he Obama was, has shown us. He was brilliant at that. Yes. And I learned everything I possibly could by just watching him hmm. and seeing how he just attracted people and could speak to their needs and articulate their needs in a most extraordinary way. I've tried to do the best I could with what I learned there over mm -hmm. the 30 years we were together. Wow. Now this, um, this is the book. That, yes, that, that's uh, the new book. The new book that you've, now you also have done a couple of others, Jailhouse well, Lawyers, well, Jailhouse Lawyers <laughs> is Mumia's book, which I introduced and which I edited. Oh, Angela Davis, yes. And CLR, A New Notion. Yes. Well, that is I, I like the first essay in that in particular. I don't think it's generally known. It's called Every Cook Can Govern, mm -hmm. about Greek democracy. And I feel the Occupy movement in particular, but all of us are discussing how to have democracy. We don't assume we have it when the poorest are poor. That's true. And so we have to look again at how to get everybody participating. And CLR proposes something tentatively as a background, not do this, but this has been done, look at it and see if you need to. Mm. And uh, I think it's a very good piece. Yes. Um, coming back to um, <coughs> sex, race, and class, you also talk, you, you say it's a perspective for winning and you think that we have that in our grasp at, at some foreseeable point? You know, we don't have a lot of time because Greenland is melting. And if Greenland melts, we have to do things quickly. We have to get, get it together. But I see a lot of signs <coughs> in this country. I, I see it also in Europe. In Europe, they're exploding in, in movements mm. in the whole of Western Europe, with the exception of the UK so far. But it, there is a lot of sign that people want to be together and that they understand the need for it the right Occupy now. The Occupy movement has this. And I think that electing that. President Obama, I don't know what it did for the president, but it did a lot for us mm -hmm. because we saw that if we got it together, we can get we can something get done. Something. It's only a beginning, mm -hmm. but it's a hope and it's a belief that we can change the world. And that's what we need that's right we now. Need. We need that hope. Okay. Well, that's the book, Sex, Race, and Class. And I have been really honored, and I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us. Thank you so much for it's joining us. It's been my Academy pleasure. Mission. And Lovely. all the best to you. Continue. You still have the fire. And keep going. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it for us on Carib Nation. Until next time, I'm Doris Dean. Mm -hmm.